welcome all our viewers. It's been a wonderful session that we have been having with uh, my brother here, Janos. You are with me once again, uh, Johanne Daniel Tembo. All right, so today, as we are trying to come together for this one great purpose, to learn more about God and Christ and the life that we have in Christ. So today we are looking at only one baptism. There is a contrast, there is a difference. Some people do want to contemplate a rebaptism. Okay. Some things have happened, some events have gone on in their lives, and they might contemplate rebaptism. So in this session, we are trying to look at the difference or the baptism of John and also the baptism in Christ, the baptism in Jesus' name. So that will be the cornerstone of our uh, message today. So, Brother Anos, uh, may you take the floor? Sure. Thank you, Johanne. And welcome, everyone, to this study. We are uh, moving on with our topic of baptism. Last time, I shared with you some practical aspects of baptism about the cleansing of your soul from the burdens of sin. And there is one more thing I would like to share about baptism because um, as I'm speaking to a lot of people, I, I, I discover that a lot of people struggle with this issue even though they were baptized, they had a kind of experience or a kind of commitment in whatever church they went to and they are still not satisfied they, with their experience. I myself was like that. I had a baptism and I was not satisfied. So uh, it's really something um, I've seen happening, especially uh, with those people who are coming out of uh, various churches where they were baptized either as children or adults, but uh, they find that there's something uh, missing. Something is myth missing. And uh, I would like to entitle this uh, speech as only one baptism. Uh, because if we look at the actual scripture, mm, we find that there are multiple baptisms spoken of. And that's something that many Christians don't realize. And what's worse that they don't realize which baptism they are having. And in the first section, I'm going to tell you about, this, about a baptism that is not good enough. And I'm going to show it to you from scripture. So. Um, this is our main verse that we are beginning with each of these studies in Acts 2, 38, which says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we've, been, we've talked about repentance, and we've talked a bit about baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and I want to show this to you that actually there is just one baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. So every one of you who are considering rebaptism, I'm telling you this, you cannot be rebaptized. Because in Ephesians 4, it says there is one body and one spirit, just as you two were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So out of all these things, there exists only one, including baptism. I'm not going to go through the list, but I, I'm just, I just wish to put this to you to consider there's just one baptism. So I, I'm going to share with you a very interesting example from the scriptures where you can actually see that see for yourself that there is truly one baptism even though there might be multiple kinds of baptisms but there is still one baptism which the book of 
act is talking about, uh, which is the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. There's just one of it. And I would like to show you uh, a story from the book of Acts, chapter 19, when Paul visited some people in Ephesus. Um, actually, you can read it for yourself in the first couple of verses, but uh, I'm going to read uh, most of it for you because it's, it's very interesting. So while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through the inland regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples there and said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul said, Into what then were you baptized? Into John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Now, there were about tw 12 men in all, so these were 12 people who were all baptized into John's baptism. But let me ask you this question. Were they baptized? This is an interesting question because we just read from Ephesians chapter 4, there is just one baptism. And then if you look at the story, Paul baptized them in the Lord Jesus. So before that, were they baptized? Think about your answer. Well, they had, a, they had a kind of baptism, but it was not the one baptism Paul is talking about. So notice, it's, it's talking about a very specific experience. And how did Paul know that they were not baptized the way they should have been? If you read the whole passage, you will notice that straight in the beginning. So when Paul met these people, he they were they were disciples. So they were students. They were followers of the way. They were they were talking about the Messiah because John was speaking about the Messiah. So they were talking about the Messiah who was to come, and Paul started to mingle with them and he listened to them. And started talking with them and then he immediately recognized there was something missing and notice he didn't even start talking about jesus or about um what they what they were believing in he immediately cut to the point did you receive the holy spirit when you believed so we are going to come back to this in the following lessons, but here's something very crucial to what we are saying. So if you are just baptized and you haven't received the Holy Spirit, you are missing it all. You are missing the whole point. That was the situation of these 12 people. And when Paul started to fellowship with them, he immediately noticed there's something wrong with these people. They are not talking like they are born again. They are not living like they are born again. They are still living in, in, a, in a way that corresponds to a lesser experience. And that's why Paul actually asked them, into what then were you baptized? And when they answered frankly into John's baptism, Paul began to teach them, okay, so what's wrong with John's baptism? There is a contrast between John's baptism and the baptism in Jesus' name. And it's not a matter of words, words spoken over you. So it's not like if you are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus or in you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit or whatever, it's 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 valid it's okay it's not like that because notice the question that paul asked them was this 
Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He didn't ask which words were used when you were baptized. Did you notice that? He was talking about the experience. So what kind of experience goes together with John's baptism and the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus? That is the question we are going to look at today. Because unless you are baptized truly in the name of the Lord Jesus, you, you, you truly have this experience that comes along with this baptism, you are not baptized with the one baptism we are talking about because there is just one baptism. Okay, so let's look at John's baptism. We can read about this in Luke chapter 3. And I highly recommend that you look up the whole chapter because uh, you can find more details to this. But I'm going to um, emphasize just a few points. So in Luke chapter 3, uh, we read about John beginning to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So this is just plain verbatim of what Paul is expressing to the Ephesians. So John baptized you the baptism of repentance, right? This is what he preached. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But here's the crucial point. What did he mean by this repentance and forgiveness of sins? Notice how he preached in Luke chapter 3 from verses 7 and onward. So John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit that proves your repentance. And don't begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God can raise up children for Abraham from these stones. So notice one thing about John's baptism. He said, produce fruit that proves your repentance. And what did he mean by that? He got real specific when people asked him, what should we do? So in in uh, same chapter, Luke 3, verses 10 and onward, uh, the crowds were asking him, what then should we do? John answered them, the person who has two tunics must share with the person who has none. And the person who has food must do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Collect no more than you are required to. Then some soldiers asked him, And as for us, what should we do? He told them, Take money from no one by violence or by false accusation and be content with your pay. Okay, so notice when John is talking about repentance, what does he actually mean by that? He says, produce fruit that proves your repentance or produce the fruit of repentance to be more specific in this, in translation. So it's the fruit of repentance. So what is the fruit of repentance as John puts it? It's that you share when you have more with others, you don't extort people uh, from their money, you don't misuse your authority. So it's, it's basically good behavior. John was teaching the people to, to become better by trying harder. To keep the law in, in a spiritual way. To be good persons. That's what he actually taught people to do. That was John's baptism. So when he was talking about repentance for the forgiveness of sins, it was a pledge from the part of the people that I would try harder and become a better person. So notice John's baptism was about you trying to become good by not doing things which you did and doing things which are in harmony with God's requirements. That was John's baptism about. 
and now you can see why that was not good enough because in actual fact this can never work as I've, as we've been going through um, these studies, you might have realized there is one crucial fault with this kind of baptism. And this is our inability to do what is good. So that, that's the whole point. So even though you might want to try to behave as good as you wish to, you still can't. And when Jesus came to the scene, he even added to this. In Matthew 5, he said, be as perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So good luck. If you try to do that, good luck. Have fun doing, trying to do that. And when you say, okay, it's not working out, I'm done with this, then you can come back and ask the right questions. So what on earth am I doing and how to uh, how to become fit for heaven and for fellowship with the Father? And Jesus is going to tell you, OK, try harder. No, he won't tell you that. He told it plainly to Nicodemus, unless you are born of the spirit and of water, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, how is the baptism in Jesus' name different? We've actually looked at this in our previous study, but I would like to come back to this. So, we, we've looked at John's baptism, which is me trying harder to become better. It doesn't work. So Paul said, okay, this is not good enough. This is not the baptism that is valid. So just think about this. Just, just think about this. I, I would like to share just one more thing about this, uh, even though this is going to be our next lesson's material. But notice, Paul asked these poor people, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? How did they receive the Holy Spirit in this story? If you read it through, they didn't receive the Holy Spirit through baptism. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So it, this is one small detail that you might just quickly skip over but this is what the word says and we see this pattern over and over again in the new testament and i'm going to show this to you next time in more in greater detail but i just wanted to show you that simply by getting baptized in the name of the lord jesus they didn't receive the holy spirit they received the holy spirit by paul placing his hands on them and praying for them Actually, the, 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 the thing that he actually prayed over them, uh, it doesn't say here, but it says in another passage in Acts 8, when uh, Peter and John are praying for the Samaritans. You can go ahead and check it for yourself, but we are going to look at that in the next lesson. But here's the thing. Paul asked these people, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? They didn't. Then Paul baptized them and placed his hands on them so the Holy Spirit can fill them. So if it was not about the baptism, so it was not at the baptism when they received the Holy Spirit, but when Paul laid his hands on them. Why did he baptize them again? Or why did he baptize them? If it was not the baptism when they received the Holy Spirit. But that was the problem, you see. He didn't ask them, so in what name were you baptized? Did you believe the correct doctrines when you were baptized? He asked neither of those questions. It was 
about the experience and the experience came to them with him laying hands on them, not with him baptizing them. So why on earth did he baptize them if they were already baptized? Can you see the point? So John's baptism is not good enough. It's not the baptism. It's not the kind of baptism that is good enough for you to be born again. Because Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So here's the thing, unless you are born of the water, you are baptized in the water as an experience that will bring you to the kingdom, you cannot enter the kingdom. So John's baptism is not, is not this kind of experience. This is what this story teaches us. So what this means is that if you are baptized in any church, in any way, for with, with, with the mindset of you pledging yourself to become better, to, to live in harmony with the, the uh, requirements or the commandments of God, if it's about your effort, it's John's baptism. And it's not good enough. That's the whole point of it. So, let me show you Jesus' baptism in this respect. We are going to Romans chapter 6. Like I said last time, we are going to explore this a bit more in depth. And this is what we are going to do this time. So, in Romans chapter 6, we read about baptism into Christ Jesus. Or do you know? that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from, raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. So notice when John was baptizing people he taught them to try harder, to, to bring forth fruits of repentance, to show with their lives that they have already changed. So it was a pledge from their part, from human, the human being's part, to, to do good, to try to do good. But this is completely different. So in Romans 6, he says that this kind of baptism is a death, is a kind of death. So when you are dead, what do you do when you are dead? You don't do anything. How hard are you trying to do good when you are dead? How hard are you trying to fix your own life when you are dead? You see the point? So when you are baptized into Christ Jesus, that's the end of your story. That's the end of your own efforts. It's an admission from your part that I can't do any better. There's no way. I can become a better person. I can't fix my own life. I can't live a life that's going to me make me happy and make my loved ones happy and make my surroundings happy. I can't make it. It's better off dead. That's, that's a choice. I mean, it's, it's really a choice, but it's a choice to end my own efforts. Unlike John's, so you see, John's baptism in, in striking construct, John's baptism is about me trying harder to get better. And a lot of people who are baptized into churches, they are taught uh, certain doctrines, certain ways of living. And when before they get baptized, they take a vow on themselves that they are going to do better. 
Think about John's baptism. That is exactly what these people were doing in John's baptism and it was not good enough. Baptism in Jesus' name is death. Is you admitting that your own efforts are not good enough, will never be good enough, and you are as good as dead, trying harder. No way. It, it, won't, it won't work. Never worked will never work. So, he, Paul continues in Romans 6, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him, so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So here's the catch. When you are dead, you no longer care about what's happening to you. You no longer care what's about your life, your problems, your sicknesses or, or your, your situations. You, you don't have anything anymore to do uh, under the sun. That is what the Bible says about death. It's truly a place of rest. Even for the wicked, it's, it's a place of rest when they don't have any more of what part. They don't partake in anything anymore that happens under the sun. They are just completely uh, done with their lives and they lose all, all their uh, consciousness, their emotions, uh, their memories. Everything is lost in death. Just for the sake of you asking, their, the memory of the person is recorded by God. So you won't be lost forever because there's a resurrection. But for the time being, while you are dead, you are unconscious. That's what the Bible is talking about. So this is why Paul uses this example of death. Because if you are united with Christ in the likeness of his death, sin has no more effect on you. That is what he says, who, someone who has died has been freed from sin. And that applies to everyone. Even mass murderers won't do anything bad when they are dead. Just think about it. So uh, when even the worst kind of criminals are harmless uh, people when they are dead. So this is... This applies to everyone. Someone who has died has been freed from sin. So it's, it's a kind of liberating thought that you are not anymore um, tied up with sin anymore. Either the burden of sin and the doing of sin. So you are not compelled to sin anymore because you are dead that's that's the whole point that paul is making i strongly encourage you to read it for yourself because you will get a better picture but i just want to make this point about baptism so uh, if you go through this passage you will notice something specific about death and it's not your death it's about christ's death so we were baptized into christ jesus we were baptized into his death we were buried with him through baptism uh, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death our old man was crucified with him so what's the meaning of all this so it's it's very specific. It's not you dying to yourself. It's not you trying to 
kick sin out of your life. Because that's how a lot of Christians try to, uh, to, to look at uh, baptism. So now I'm, I'm going to try to eradicate all sinful activities, habits, thoughts, emotions from my life so that I can become, I, I can die to myself completely. But that is not what Paul is talking about. He said, we died with Christ, that's past tense. So it's not what you do. It's not about what you do. It's what Christ has already done. If I, I, I started out and explaining what all this means, it would, it would take a very long time. So I've just refrained from it. Uh, for the time being, but I, I just want to add that you can get all the benefits of what Christ has accomplished through water baptism and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So these two experiences will bring you into Christ's accomplished work. And this is the reason while you don't have to become a better person. We are because you are going to become the best of the best person you can ever get when you receive Jesus Christ. And end of the story. I know this is sci fi to a lot of people because it's it's something that happens instantly in your life. And I'm not talking about your works. I'm talking about your being, the kind of person you are. And remember, we've, we've been looking at this passage in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a remover of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So notice, baptism is tied up with an appeal for a good conscience. So it's, it's worth looking up this word from the dictionary, uh, from the original uh, uh, scriptures, the Greek. It's, it, this word conscience, it also means the way you identify yourself. Well, in today's world, people identify as all kinds of things and persons. Uh, men identify themselves as women, women identify themselves as men and animals and all strange stuff. But there is one thing that we need to understand that it's in the Bible. The way you identify yourself as is crucial because when you appeal to God for a good conscience, it's not just that, it's not about your ability to recognize the moral implications of an action. So it's not like you hit someone uh, after you get baptized and you hit someone in the face, you punch someone and you are not going to feel anything about it. You are going to feel good about it. It's not like that. But there is going to be a striking change when you experience this because um, uh, this this baptism because it changes the way you look at yourself. It changes the way you identify yourself. Because before this, when you think about how you are, what you are, how you have been, what your standing is with God, if you think about your life, you identify yourself as a sinner, as someone who is not good enough, who is not worthy for the blessings of God. Because if you look at the law, look at its requirements, you will always find yourself lacking. 
Paul explains this in extreme detail in the book of Galatians. So if you are in that spot, I recommend that you study the book of Galatians. But even when, if you are not religious, even non-religious people can, can attest to the fact that they have messed up their lives. So that's the whole point of it. If you have messed up your life and you are at the end of your own efforts, you, you, you can, you can say about yourself, okay, I'm a good for nothing. I, I cannot command or I, I, I cannot lead my life as I ought. So I'm, I'm like a disabled person. It's a way of saying you are a sinner. You're missing the mark. You cannot, you're, you're, you're disabled. Well, that's the word for people who are lacking some kind of uh, natural um, abilities like seeing, hearing, uh, ability to, to, to move their hands, their feet, anything like that. So, so it's like you're lacking the ability to do something that you, you should be able to do. And that puts you in the category of having an evil conscience. You're, you're, you're thinking about yourself as someone who is, who is not able, who, who keeps lacking, who keeps uh, missing the mark. And baptism changes that. So notice what Peter says about baptism. It's actually a burial of your old identity. So baptism is a burial of your old identity. You are no longer a sinner. That's what Paul experienced when he got baptized. He recounts this experience in Acts 22 verse 16. And now what are you waiting for? This is what Ananias, a disciple of Jesus, told to Paul. Get up, be baptized and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So when you have your sins washed away, it's like a flood, a flood that takes away everything that you have. It takes away your house, your belongings, your old life. It takes away everything you were. You get a fresh start. And your fresh start is not you trying to rebuild your old life again. The fresh start is starting to live another kind of life. A life where there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's not connected to what you do, how you perform. It's connected to the kind of life that you are going to receive through the Spirit. But for you to be able to receive the life, the new life, first, your old life needs to die. And like I said, you cannot die unto yourself, but you can enter into the death of Jesus Christ through baptism. And he is going to take your old life and wash it away like a flood. Take it away. Take away your old faulty sinful identity so that you can enter into a new experience. So this is my question to you, whether you are already had a kind of water baptism or you are all new to this. My question to you is not in which name were you baptized? How many times you were baptized? Did you try hard enough? My question is, have you had the experience of the one baptism? That is an end of all other baptisms, of all other um, trying your best, giving your best, 
shot at trying to live a, a good life. Have you done with it? Are you done with it? Have you experienced the relief of surrendering it all? Surrendering your efforts, what you have done, what you have, what others have done to you. Have you experienced this? This is the question. It's not so much about the formula that you are baptized or when when you were baptized have have you completely fully 100 percent immersed into water or was there one hair standing out on your head i mean just I, i'm just talk, speaking silliness but you get the point do you have the experience that is my question because there is only one baptism if you have that experience you are baptized with water in the name of Jesus Christ and you are dead with him you can always go back to this experience but like I said there's one more thing and this is what we are going to follow up in the next lesson have you actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and if not and I'm talking about myself. I have been baptized in water, but I have not received the baptism with the Holy Spirit for quite some time. So that is a game changer. But in order to be able to enter into that experience, into receiving life, first, your life needs to be put to death. So that's about the one, one baptism. And I do encourage you to think about your own experience, whether you have this experience. And if not, then you have to look for someone who is a disciple of Jesus and who is going to help you to get baptized and teach you in the ways of the Lord and receive a new life. May God bless you in that. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you so much for the message. We praise God um, for what he has given us today. Um, I see that there are a lot of confusion. Um, you find one person moves from one church to another, and they have to be rebaptized, meaning now baptism is changed into and integrate into membership of different uh, groups and denominations and so on. So that one, I believe there is a mass confusion. So thank you so much. I've uh, learned a lot myself. And I pray that our viewers will continue to be with us, especially as we are looking into this lesson and more in the next session. May God be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.